Good evening. I'd like to call to order the March 14th, 2022 meeting of the East Penn School District Board of Directors. Uh, please rise for Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first up on the agenda, our request to address the board, we have four. Um, I ask that after I call your name, uh, please come to the podium and do again provide your name. Um, again, you'll have three minutes to speak. And our first speaker is Ashlyn, and I apologize, Mogaro. Hello, I'm Ashley Magavro and a member of the basketball team at the high school. As a member of the team, I see a problem with our basketball court and the space we currently have. Right now, there are some safety concerns due to the lack of space. Speak. Um, as when members of the girls team went to the boys basketball game, we had to sit on the steps. This becomes a major safety problem. If an emergency were to come up, it would have taken us much longer to move, and it would have just been a mob of people coming from the stands. We also can't sit as a team because our benches are too small, and there's a bubble forming under the sidelines of the court. It is visible in pushing up the court. Adding more space to our gym can benefit our school in several ways. We could greatly increase school activities, such as pep rallies and school-wide meetings, if we could all fit into the gym safely. The only place currently that we can fit in the, the student body is the football stadium, which means during the winter or bad weather, we can't do anything. It can also benefit our school's or basketball team because during practice, we can only do one team full court at a time. Varsity goes a couple times, then JV runs through it. Having more space means both teams can go at the same time. I understand this comes to a great cost, although there are potential options for sponsors and advertisements to absorb the cost. Some others express issues that they see with our gym. As when the bleachers come out, the court becomes small and difficult to evacuate in hope of emergency were to arise. The overcrowding of the stands could lead to a fire hazard if the gym were to be packed, and being that there's a bubble forming under the court, and if it were to get worse, it could possibly ruin other parts of the court. If we can't do anything about our gym, I believe it needs to be maintained more because every time we practice, the court is always really slippery, and that makes it hard for us athletes to keep our bodies in control. On top of that, it can lead to injuries. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Megan Forst, and she's going to talk tonight about adding an item to the district calendar. This is going to be a little last minute. I wasn't able to be here at the last board meeting. Um, next week, next Monday, is March 21st, 321. As most of you know, or if you don't know, my son is at the high school, he's in 11th grade, and he has Down syndrome. Down syndrome is the third copy of the 21st chromosome. So next Monday is World Down Syndrome Day. It is also what we call Rock Your Socks Day. It's a fun day for kids, adults, to wear funky socks, just something fun. Um, every year since he's been in kindergarten, I ask his class teacher, and that building specific principal, if they could do something. I believe I've asked in the past administration or Miss Campbell's office um, as a phone call, and I always get told it's only up to the building principal and I would need to call each building personally. I only take it as far as I can. Um, I'm asking that it's one day I know last year it was posted on the social media that it was World Down Center Day. But if we can make an announcement, I know the middle school and high school have email announcements and somewhere else that all schools next Monday, Rock Your Socks Day for Down Syndrome. We have April is Autism Awareness Month. We always do something then. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We always have weeks where we wear pink to school, just fun spirit days. Um, October is actually also Down Syndrome Awareness Month. Nothing gets done either, wearing blue or yellow. Something simple just to add those days to the calendar. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you, Ms. Forrest. Uh, our next speaker is Donna Spedalier, and to talk about the budget. I would like to address the board tonight on the budget. My family and I moved to East Penn School District the summer of 2020. We left Salisbury Township School District when our beloved elementary school was closed. Our former school district made poor financial decisions. And for many years leading up to the school's closure, for example, our former school administration shot for the stars. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. And took time away from the traditional curriculum to focus on, quote, the whole student. The program such as Leader and Me, which was based on Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. <clears throat> this new curriculum cost the school district a lot of money. And honestly, I didn't see a change in how the students benefited from it. Overall, the standardized test scores went down most students found it to be a waste of time, and quite frankly, it became a joke to others. I tell you this because I know the Panorama survey was given out for good intentions. However, I've been listening to the budget proposals, and I've heard that taxes will most likely be raised. And I understand the, that certain items need to be funded, but not all at this moment. We have a lot of hardships in our community, Inflation, the cost of gas, for example, it's only making it more difficult to make ends meet, especially go coming off the heels of a pandemic. I urge you to put the comprehensive planning on the back burner. Remote and hybrid learning left gaps in the students' basic academic achievements. Can we please keep focused on filling the gaps from the past two years? Our students and stakeholders deserve that. Thank you. Our final speaker tonight is Karen Durholtz on rescheduling SAT to 326-22. Good evening. Thanks for allowing me the opportunity to talk. And I just first wanted to take that opportunity to say thank you to the administration and the board. For the last two years, I don't, I've never spoken in front of you before, but I just wanted to say thank you very much. It's been a challenging time for all of us, and I appreciate all your dedication and what I'm sure is many, many hours of hard work that you put into making our kids uh, in the last two years enjoyable as they could be. Uh, the reason I'm here tonight is due to the snowstorm on Saturday, unexpectedly, obviously the SATs were canceled across the board in the region where the snow fell, including Lehigh Valley and Emmaus High School. Uh, the College Board allowed a reschedule to 326 for schools that wanted to take advantage of that. I, because this is all happening so quickly, I can't confirm, but I believe that Parkland, Freedom, and Southern Lehigh so far have taken advantage of that. So the kids that were scheduled to take the SAT this past Saturday can take it on 326 at those locations. The College Board is also not allowing those students at the locations that are not being rescheduled, such as Emmaus High School, which is not being rescheduled, they're not allowing those students to go somewhere else that is on 326. So if you were rescheduled, if you're scheduled here, you can't go to Freedom or Parkland to take that on 326, whereas the other times you can. Because of the reschedule, they're not allowing that. Um, the Emmaus High School recommendation is to take the SAT on May 7th. And the reason I feel like this matters is if you take yourself back to being a junior year, um, which is where my daughter is right now, she's put a ton of time and effort, as many of the students have, to really bulk up. And um, she has a tutor. She's talked study groups with friends. She spent a ton of hours away from all of her other activities, including school, to prep for this test. So to take it again in May, certainly she can do that. But it eliminates her chance to super score, which is the ability to get multiple scores on multiple tests. And this puts her at a little bit of a disadvantage to her cohorts of the schools that have rescheduled for March 26th. 
May 7th, also the next available date, is right in the middle of the AP exams. So if you're a student that does care about the SATs very highly, you're also probably a student that does care about your AP exams very highly. And that schedule date, no fault to the high school, but that schedule date is very unattractive because it's right smack in the middle of AP exams. In our case, we, my daughter has uh, four AP exams over those two weeks, so SATs would fall right in the middle of that. And just one last point, contrary to popular belief, we have been talking to a lot of admissions counselors. A lot of people are saying, obviously, the SATs are optional in many schools because of the COVID pandemic, but they are still considering them very highly. And I want to just say that point again, they're still considering them very highly. SATs are very, very important, especially if you have a very ambitious kid like mine. <laughs> Does not follow my footsteps, but she's super ambitious and really, really cares about these scores and these tests. I'm sorry she couldn't be here tonight. She has a conflict. Uh, so my question, and I just um, want to say that the time is of the essence because of the 326 is why the uh, Mays High School cannot reschedule to have that open on 326. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that concludes requests to address the board. Uh, our next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. If there are no objections, uh, I'd like to get a motion to approve both the February 28th, 22 regular board meeting minutes and the March 7th, 2022 special board meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? If not, Ms. Allen, will you call the roll? Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Motion passes. Uh, next on the agenda is the district update. Dr. Campbell? Thank you. I'll start off with a few updates um, specific for our Emmaus High School seniors. One of which is um, now available on our Emmaus High School website is a list as well as the full application for our 2022 local scholarship program. So I encourage all of our graduating seniors to please check out that um, scholarship application process. All applications are due by March 29th. So that due date is rapidly approaching and we certainly want all of our students to have an opportunity um, to take advantage of those scholarships. Also this year, and I've announced this before, we are um, offering the opportunity for family and community members to honor their graduating seniors with a class of 22 personalized senior sign. Again, information is available on the East Penn Education Foundation webpage where you can order your senior sign and those um, that sale ends on May 12th. In addition, um, one more announcement about our graduating seniors. There are a few days left for, again, community family members to nominate a graduating senior for their outstanding contributions to our school community through the 2020-22 grad, grad Spotlight Program. Nominations are accepted through March 15th. That's tomorrow, so that, that deadline is rapidly approaching. And again, nomination form for the Grad Spotlight Program is available on district as well as high school website. I want to take a moment and recognize the outstanding work of our food service employees. Last week, March 7th, was National School Breakfast Week, um, and our team did a great job celebrating and highlighting the importance of how um, uh, highlighting how important it is to start your day off with a healthy breakfast. And so they had some great activities taking place in all of our schools. I'd also like to congratulate our February East Penn Pride Award winners. Tammy Keita is our faculty winner, and Corinne Dries from um, our Human Resources Office is our staff winner. Also, just this past weekend, we had several Emmaus High School students um, who certainly continued to excel in their work, particularly in the area of band. Um, we had two students who are now headed to the state PMEA competition, Sophia Izom and Julia McDonald. That competition is coming up soon. And just yesterday, we had um, our Emmaus High School team consisting of Matt Whitmer, Matt Coyle, and Hugh Wilkes. Um, they finished first place at the Carbon Lehigh Intermediate Units Code Jam 22 programming competition that was held at DeSales University. So congratulations to that trio as well. 
I also want to remind um, our community members, this one I'm really going to bore you with, but if you have a child neighbor who is five on or before September 1st, 2022, online kindergarten registration is available and we'd love to have you register as soon as possible. The sooner that we know that you're coming, the better we can plan in terms of the number of kindergarten sections that we have, as well as we have um, some kindergarten orientation sessions that are going to be planned for this spring. East Penn is also currently accepting applications for summer employment for high school or recent high school grads for our summer maintenance and or our technology team. So um, we certainly encourage our, our students to check out our district and high school website for, for the application process. Um, in response to the, the community member who just spoke about SATs, I will share that um, certainly we recognize that the SATs were canceled on Saturday as a result of the weather, and we will certainly follow up with our high school team to find out about any potential rescheduled date. I don't have that information tonight. And finally, um, it's, it's certainly been a time in which we recognize that our world and our community have been divided on some issues over the past um, year to two years. And last Friday evening was a reminder for all of us of the strength and the unity that really does exist in our East Penn community. In particular, last Friday, March 11th, we had about a thousand community members who joined us at our, our East Penn Stadium in support of the Shave for the Brave event. You might recall in 2019, our fundraising uh, goal for that year was um, $100,000, which benefits the St. Baldrick's organization, specifically um, pediatric cancer research. This year, when I last checked at about 5 o'clock tonight, um, our community had raised over $146,000 to support the St. Baldrick's Foundation. Our top fundraisers were the Albertus Eagles. The Albertus Elementary team raised about $34,000. And the high school cross country and track and field team raised about $26,000. Our attendees in the evening included um, about 144 shavies, as well as our honorees, including several pediatric cancer survivors. Um, for those of you who were able to join me, um, I think it goes without saying, it really was an inspiring evening on many in many ways. And I just wanna give a special thanks to our athletic trainer, Liz Del Rey, and our high school guidance counselor, Kristen Grimm, and the many, many East Penn students and staff members who really poured their hearts into coordinating what was a tremendous event. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Campbell. Any questions or comments? Ms. Bowman? Oh, yes, um, just wanted to echo, it it's always makes me proud when we have events like that. And um, it was really um, wonderful to see that one of the people who stepped up to have their head shaved was the high school principal. So, um, oh, you know, uh, definitely all in on, on that. Um, I, I thought it was helpful that you um, addressed um, one of the four concerns that came up, but um, I always think it's helpful, even though this isn't a give and take, um, if the administration could even just shed some light on some of the questions that came up during public comment, if, if even to just explain why the district does things the way that we do things. Um, for example, I believe the question was about stopping comprehensive planning, but I believe that's required by the state is that I don't even think we have a say in that. Is that correct? Correct. Our district um, is, our comprehensive plan is due this year and must be submitted to the state. Correct. And then the, the other, and I'm always, um, I love when I hear from our students and um, partially because it makes me proud that we have students who are such wonderful speakers, but also because they bring concerns to the board that um, while the administration might be aware of the state of things in the gym, I certainly wasn't. Um, and I just think it would be helpful for that student to hear that this is actually one of the things that the district is working on. Um, I don't know if she was aware of that before she spoke or not. Um, it, are you referring to the facility study? Yes. Okay. So. Absolutely. One of the proposals in the facility study, as you know, that also included a comprehensive look at our, our athletic facilities. So one of the proposals was a potential 
um, I guess I wouldn't even say renovation, but a complete rebuild of the Emmaus High School gym. Again, certainly no decisions have been made at this point, but um, I too, when Ashlyn brought up some of the points about um, the size of the basketball court, I think uh, Mr. Kelly last week actually referenced, you know, the size of the current gym being um, certainly a consideration given the fact that we have a student body of about 2,800 students. And certainly I could share, I took notes of the immediate safety concerns that she mentioned, and certainly, you know, that's something that we can look into more in the short term. Okay, great. And, and then the last one was just um, to provide some information about how, um, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but I guess how calendar days are determined. Are they all determined, like spirit days and things like that at the building level, or are some of them determined district-wide? Yeah, I would say most really are determined at the building level. Um, in many cases, it's either a, you know, I should, in some cases at the elementary levels, it's oftentimes our PTOs who set that schedule for the various um, events and activities that are being celebrated. Um, there are situations as well, for example, at the secondary level where it might be SGA that sets um, the recognition of those days. Okay, all right, thank you. Any additional questions or comments? If not, thank you, Dr. Campbell. Our next item on the agenda is with, in reference to the budget. Uh, we're going to have a presentation on the long range technology plan. Uh, Dr. Campbell, would you like to introduce? I would, thank you. Um, in, in just a moment, I'm going to um, turn the presentation over to Dr. Manzo, who is our Director of Instructional Technology. And um, tonight's presentation, I will say originally as part of our budget presentations, you might recall tonight's focus was going to be on the long range fiscal plan the capital plan, as well as the technology plan. And for multiple reasons, um, our administration has made the decision to pull out and have the technology plan presented this evening. And then we will resume with our, um, our regular budget presentation cycle. And so at our March 28th presentation of the budget, we will then go into detail in terms of the long range fiscal and capital plan. So tonight's really focusing on technology. Um, you recall that um, our team has on several occasions presented to the board as well as the community in terms of the long range plan with regard to student devices as well as staff devices. And certainly that's a critical part of the district's technology plan. What you'll also see tonight is as a result of, an, as a, result of a comprehensive needs assessment um, that we recently completed, we recognize that there is far more to a district's technology than just student and staff devices. And so you're gonna hear Dr. Manzo talk a little bit more tonight about um, infrastructure as well as some device needs um, such as some of the labs that we have throughout the district. So Dr. Manzo is going to give us a high-level overview of the long-range technology plan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this really came out from um, a lot of work that our department has done. So I've been here for two full years now um, at the start of the pandemic. I was lucky enough to start, I think, the week after. Um, and since that point, there's been a lot of work that we've been doing. So um, one of the things that we did last year was we had an external audit completed by an outside company. They looked at some of our technology needs as far as our infrastructure, some safety and security updates. And then internally, we did the same. Um, one of the other things that we did was take we took a comprehensive inventory of what we have in-house. Um, so those are things that were not included in, in the original one-to-one -one budget, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, so again, the process, we took that comprehensive um, inventory. This was a lengthy process. We have a lot of devices out there. We've recycled, recycled a lot of very old devices, and there are some other ones that we need to replace. Um, we've conducted a lot of meetings with our Office of Teaching and Learning, our students, our staff, our faculty members to find out what their instructional needs are, what their bus business needs are, and making sure that we can do what we can as a district to make sure that we're meeting those needs. Um, other things that we've been doing since I've been here, uh, holding annual technology meetings. So I know that was something that we originally did, but we were keeping up with that to make sure that, the, again, the device choices are the correct choices for the students, that they're 
um, meeting again what the teachers need them to be doing in class, um, and then just looking at you know those types of things moving forward and just constantly evaluating and assessing what we're using. Um, we've also had meetings with ve vendors, other districts, our insurance carrier, and some other district personnel to look at um, our priorities, best practices, and those types of things. Um, so the important thing about this long-range plan, it is a living, breathing document. I don't want to compare it to the Constitution, um, but in a way it is. I'm sorry, I'm a history, political science uh, person. But um, it is a living, breathing do document, meaning that we constantly have to evaluate it. We have to look at how it's interpreted and then just keep moving on from there. So what you're going to see tonight is something that's going to be under constant evaluation um, every single year. So there could be certain things that may be in flux, but for the most part, I would say these are pretty constant um, uh, figures that you should be looking at for the future. So just so you have an idea, this is our budget that we are currently operating on for devices. So we have our MacBook Airs for our staff. Um, K through five, we're gonna be doing an iPad refresh. And the reason we're doing that is currently out there, when we did the, the insertion points in this district for one-to-one, -one, we have a, a vast array of iPads out there. So we have from sixth to ninth generation iPads. Um, and then we have some other things mixed in there too. We have some iPad minis that are just out in schools when we're um, just looking at kindergarten and we just want to make sure that everything's aligned so that teachers can have the same device that their students are using and everyone can really proceed um, in the fashion that they wish to. And then our last part is our Chromebooks. Every year for sixth and ninth grade, we have um, Chromebook insertion points. Those last them throughout middle school and then through their high school careers. Um, and again, every year we talk with the, those students to find out, is this the correct device for you? Is this what you would like to use? We look at features like touch screen. Do they still want the flip? Those types of things. So this year, our major change, I would say, um, that we're looking at, and we've started to integrate already, is multi-factor authentication. So if you do not know what multi-factor authentication is, um, sometimes you'll see if you try to log into your email, it'll ask, is this really you? Or if, you're, if you go to use your credit card in another country or somewhere that you're not used to being, you may get a text on your phone that says, you know, are you in this place and are you spending this money? And you hit yes or no. Um, so that's what the multi-factor authentication is. For Duo Access, we're going to be using that product. We already started integrating it with some of our platforms within the district. Some of us have been using it for the past year as super users just to get used to it. And this product is really going to help to make sure that when you're at home or you're working somewhere else, not on campus, um, and actually here too, that we know that it's actually you. You know, you're the person that you're saying that you are. Um, some other equipment that we need to buy are some hardware tokens, um, and those just are another form of authentication that a person could use. So you could use a secondary device such as an iPad, a phone, um, anything else like that, or you could use one of these tokens. For next school year, um, the first three things are software. So we're looking at Sophos Intercept X Advanced, and what this is is uh, it's this is a next generation endpoint detection and response. So instead of just your traditional um, you know, malware or software that just stops something you know, at that point after it's already been infected, this is going to pick up basically the infection when it first gets into the system, and it isolates it and stops it in its, in its tracks and makes sure that it doesn't continue to spread. Um, this is something that's really best practice at this point. Our former uh, software that we're using we don't feel like it's as robust as we would like to, it to be. So this is something that, um, you know, it's, it is really best practice. It's something that we feel, again, it's really necessary at this point. Um, know Before is something that some of you may have heard of before. It's a phishing training software. So uh, many other schools and many other companies use this um, to make sure that their users know what phishing looks like and to, to stop it. So I think most of us know right now, if you read in the paper anywhere in the news, there are, there are other agencies out there, so private public agencies that um, get their systems get infected by phishing and ransomware. Um, this is a way to fully comprehensively train the user base so that they understand you know, how to protect themselves against those things. The last part is the Windows desktop management tool. We're currently investigating this just as a provisioning and management tool just to push out some of those updates again to those computers that we're going to be purchasing. The other items on here are all labs. Um, so we're looking at labs at the high school. And the reason why we're looking at some of these labs is just to make sure that they meet the curricular 
needs that the students have in the classes. So for example, PLTW um, runs a number of different self software programs and the, those computers have to be very robust. Um, what we're currently running them on, it's meeting the need, it's right there. Um, but next year we saw the new specs and the new specs are gonna require that they need um, better video cards, more memory, more RAM, those types of things. Uh, same thing for pretty much everything else that's up there. Um, we're just looking at things that are end of service life that need to get updated. The school year after that, again, you're gonna see the, a lot of the same type of things. So labs, circulation, computers at libraries, um, it's mostly school-based devices. The other things that we're looking at are firewall. So right now we have a great firewall. We just want to make sure it's the firewall we want to keep. Uh, the other thing that we have to look at is a wire, wireless controller. We had a full infrastructure update here in 2018. Um, so one of those wireless controllers, we just have to make sure that we get the correct licensing so that it keeps working. Um, the last part is projectors. So we want to keep working on, you know, um, refreshing those projectors in the classrooms to make sure that they meet with the technology that the teachers are currently using. And I did go into a classroom the other day and the kids were doing a really wonderful job of projecting using their Apple TV and the projector in the classroom. So I do have to say the kids are also using them very nicely as well. And they were demonstrating to each other how to do stuff, which is wonderful. Um, this is our last big component, the 24-25 school year. So again, that network infrastructure update there are going to be parts of the network that may need to be updated. Until we have um, a comprehensive plan and we have another outside entity look with us, we will not know all of those um, areas where we may need an update. So our access points, when we put them in in 2018, it was about, I would say about 98% of our units were put in at that time. Um, they could possibly be fine, but we might also need to get them refreshed. So as you know, technology is always being updated. Um, we would probably suggest at this point to update those access points. That's a few years out from now. Um, and depending on those access points, we would have to also look at the other things that go with them, the wireless controllers, our power over ethernet switches. Um, and again, it's all kind of dependent on what we choose as an access point. The other two things are labs, and those are kind of further down in our spectrum here because those are under curriculum revision at this point. Our final part of this, um, these, these are just some future financial considerations. Um, our Apple TVs, so that was part of the Classrooms 2.0 vision. So in our elementary schools, every single classroom has an Apple TV right now. Some of them, just because of the time that they were put in, they may need a refresh as well. Um, so that's something our department would like to facilitate. We don't want to leave that up to the building. We feel like that's really something that we'd like to keep a hold of so we can make sure everything's updated, everything's running smoothly together. Projectors, again, um, we, sent, we have some aged projectors out there, out there in our fleet that we're just constantly looking to refresh. Um, one of our technicians, I told him, you know, for the next year or two, you're going to just be putting in projectors. I hope you're okay with that. And he said, I, I hope you're joking. And I, I said, no, I'm not joking because um, you do a great job at this and this is what we really need. It's a need of the district. Uh, the edge switches and closets, again, when you look at the rest of these things, um, they're really dependent on our business needs and service life. So many of them, we're not foreseeing that they're part of the actual budget. It's just something that at some point it might be needed, but it also could be perfectly fine to keep going. So for example, the UPS infrastructure, um, it's basically a network closet and it's the battery pack that uh, gives power to that closet. So if one of those goes, it's $1,000. If they would all go at the same time, that's the full price. We would never see a, a time where we would have to replace an entire fleet. We wanted to just give you that input so you knew what it would look like if we ever decided to do those things. The last three items are all recent items. Those are items that have a very long service life. We're not expecting that we would need any refresh on those at any point soon. So if you had any questions now, that's really the bulk of the presentation. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Manzo, for that overview. Uh, be happy to take any questions or comments from the board. Mr. Champagne. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manzo. Um, 
when we look at some of these non uh, one to one device uh, purchases, what are those? Are those budgeted as part of the just general, let's say, operating fund, or are those going to go against the capital requirements that we have, and will that be out of the capital portion of the, the budget? I'm not sure exactly which part of the budget that would be coming from, but the transfer would be coming into the technology budget, so it would be more of a centralized purchase. Um, at this point, it's the schools have been paying for some of these items. Um, we don't want to leave that up to the school to have to make that need-based determin determination. So we feel as a department that we know best if something is end of service life, um, if we could do anything to keep it updated, those types of things. Um, but we're asking for some of that transfer to come from a different portion of the budget back to our department to make sure that again we can keep an eye on those things make sure that everything's up to date and taken care of and refreshed in a timely manner um, what we've seen it by it not being in our budget directly is that some of those things have not been um, refreshed at the rate that I think some of the users would like to see them refreshed so maybe Mr. Saul can answer it <clears throat> sure absolutely um, in terms of using the, the capital um, capital reserve fund, the monies that we set aside for capital, uh, not a whole lot of these items would qualify for that because they need to be infrastructure assets okay. in order to use those funds. It's re they're restricted by law. Um, so things like wiring and the, you know, permanent wiring in the buildings, right. those things would qualify. Um, if you so, so the items that are being proposed um, year over year, if you'll recall, when uh, we presented a, for the first draft of the budget, we put uh, $500,000 uh, in addition to the regular technology um, department budget, which is really for you know break fix and those types of needs, and the um, device budget, which Dr. Manzo showed us at first, we put an additional $500,000 in recognition of you know the aging um, assets we have in terms of technology and trying to implement this plan that she's put forth. Okay, so it's going to be, it's not going to, based on what you're telling me, mo the majority of this spend will come out of just general operating funds, not the capital. Correct. Only Correct. when we go into more detailed infrastructure overhaul would that qualify. Does any of this qualify with ESSER funds? Can we use any of that in terms of the uh, enhancement to learning and so forth to take any advantage of that? And, does, and the other question I have is, does any of this qualify for E-rate? So some of it will qualify for E-rate. And so there are some things like the course, which we got, um, that was E-rateable. So when we do some of the infrastructure upgrades, uh, the firewall, those types of things, and that's part of the reason with, when we look at the timeline, it's very specific to make sure that it, those things are um, E-rateable. So we wouldn't refresh an entire fleet. You, you actually can't refresh a fleet before it's, it's up for E-rate. E so um, when we look at those types of things, it is very deliberate when we mapped it out to make sure, like for the firewall, for example, for us to investigate it, we have to make sure that that capacity of when we first purchase the firewall compared to when we're looking to refresh it, or if we possibly refresh it, it fits within that time span. So do these figures include the E-rate discount or do not include the E-rate discount? They do not. So do we have a sense of how much that discount would be? It's difficult because we can't even put a bid out there or ask the question because we're not quali we're not even at allowed to ask for a bid at this point because we're not eligible. So we had to put in the figures that we used the last time, um, and those were the placeholders. But we really can't. I talked to several vendors, and they said we we can't give you anything legally um, because you're not eligible at this time. So none of these spend for next year is e that's what I guess I'm trying to get at is none of the spends for next year are e rateable no so those are all software and those are devices um, so we didn't have anything um, that that would fit into that container so even when we look at the the one wireless controller that's software for the wireless controller right so that's not something that it, that we could use it's got to be like physical hardware for it to be e rateable yeah okay so and then going forward you'll take advantage of the e-rate program when it's yes when it's appropriate yes okay. our department is very used to being i don't want to say we're, hmm, we're we're very fiscally aware 
So we try to make our choices um, when we're picking devices, when we're looking at solutions, we make sure that it's financially something that we can sustain, and it's also going to be the best product that we can we can manage and we can put out there for our users. All right. And then, like, a, any of the ESSER monies, would any of this qualify for use of that, or do we want to use it for... Yeah, okay. so in terms of ESSER, um, if I can just break that into two components, one would be um, ESSER 2 and then the ARP ESSER, ESSER 3, which were the two really big pieces that totaled about $8.5 million. Um, we, as the board may recall, we targeted staff salaries and maintaining existing staff as the reason um, uh, for using those funds. The, we then set an equivalent amount of funds into a bucket, right, that we could use for any number of reasons, but specifically we're targeting the, the learning loss um, and we've, you know, employed staff, right. the um, interventionists. And so we, we really would like to stay the course on that and trying to, to, to do those inter, uh, interventions um, and address the learning loss. The other piece of ESSER is, um, you know, some various components through IDEA and some, some set-aside funds that they have. Um, those grants... Uh, we're still working down the road on. They've been approved. We certainly could change them, but they're very specific in how those can be spent. So those ones that we have more flexibility with right now are just really, really targeted um, and specific. We saw that as ESSER, you know, as the mo as the ESSER grants came out, the early ones were really flexible. The later ones became very specific. Okay. Very good. Thank you. That's my question. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Any more questions? Mr. Baird. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation, Dr. Manzo. I just have a couple of questions. Uh, one of the questions I had is uh, basically, did you have any information or any uh, proposals for any IT upgrades for teaching, teaching technology for teachers, like interactive boards and things like that, remote teaching and virtual? I have looked at interactive boards. Um, I will tell you they are of great cost. Um, it's something that we implemented in my prior district, um, and I would say that they don't necessarily always work with the technology that we have in our district. Um, so my former district had very similar devices, and there were certain things that the solution just didn't work. Um, so those interactive boards, depending on which ones you're looking at, you could be looking at a two to $3,000 expenditure per board, per classroom. Um, and then when you add on top of it that you might have to add an Apple TV and some other things and networking, um, it gets very, very costly. Okay. Also, we have a Jasper program. Any, any uh, look at anything that we need to upgrade in that situation to make that more robust? Remote teaching? I do communicate with the Office of Teaching and Learning uh, very frequently. So there are certain things that they do use. So I'll, I'll say they use um, Amazon Web Services. And many of you know what Amazon Web Services is. It does deliver some, um, like Schoology is actually powered through Amazon Web Services. But you can also deliver certain tools like Adobe or Illustrator or any of those things through AWS. And we do have some students that are using that in Jasper so that they get a more comprehensive education. Okay. Another question I have is the, the leases, the MAC leases, I guess, for 140000 a year. Now, basically, looking at that, is there any other uh, machine we could use that's less, more cost-effective than the MAC machine on a lease basis? There are other machines out there that I could say we could use. I, I will say as a return on investment, um, generally for Apple products, we, we get a lot more back than if, if you would sell a Windows product. Um, or a PC. So we have contacted different vendors and said, we have these things in stock, what can we get back for these products? And we have these things in stock, what can we get back for these products? Um, there's quite a substantial differential. I think part of that is because there are many people that are more willing, if, if they buy refurbished uh, Apple product, they would buy it in personal or professional setting, whereas um, you'll see that Windows devices, the resale for them is, is just not as high. So um, that's part of it. And also for our students that are using iPads and our teachers that are using iPads um, and the Apple TVs, they all work together. If we would switch devices with teachers right now, those things would all fail. They wouldn't, they're not compatible. Now these machines, they're leased and we get new machines, refresh them? Yep, so at the end of the lease, we actually purchase everything out for $1. And then at, at that point, we either use them for other staff members. So right now we're using um, 
a lot of our MacBook Airs from 2015 for substitutes. Um, we use them for other support staff members, those types of things. And then we can also sell them. So there are, are a number of options. Right now, our best option was to hold on to many of them because we just had the need for them within the district at this point. And one more comment. Uh, you say you joined about two years ago at the end of the pandemic. Thank you for your staff, all the work you guys have done. <laughs> thank you. Uh, to get us through this situation and, and help us through this remote learning. So thank you and your staff. I will let them know they, they're a great staff. Yeah. That's all I have, thank you. Mr. Smith? Yes, thank you for um, sharing with us kind of the, the uh, budgetary impact of some of the um, uh, refreshes and, and, and upgrades and, and things that we are looking at for the next couple of years, several years. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you to um, kind of share your department, maybe not your personal, but your department's vision. And I'm going to, I'm going to um, piggyback from Dr. Whitney's, I think it was your question from a couple weeks ago, of the vision for 21st century learning. And the, and the reason why I'm framing this um, uh, this question for you is because when you take a look at kind of some of the price tags that are uh, attached to some of these items like they're not small um and and um i i think that there may be some members of the community that would look at this and say um you know that that's a lot of money that we're putting towards technology so there's a couple of um in this big question of of, of kind of your vision for the, the purpose of some of these items are this kind of twofold and, and one being um, some of these items here if you could speak to kind of the purpose behind um, why we need to have some of these in terms of an insurance standpoint and, and that piece but also um, uh, in in you know in the ch short couple of years you've seen some pretty um, dynamic changes sometimes because of necessity but other times because of some of things that we've asked the taxpayers to fund in terms of refreshes and things like that. So um, curious as to some of the impacts that you've seen to student learning on a day-to-day -day basis because of some of these things and kind of like what we're looking forward to in some of these um, budgetary items over the next few years. Okay. Um, well, I think one of the things that we should consider is, you know, when we look at our portrait of, of a graduate and that's a big part of what East Penn is trying to do is to prepare our students for the future. And when we're offering them courseware on devices that's aged out and the software won't run, um, obviously that's, that's an issue that we have as a school district. And it's something that we feel very strongly, I think, as a, a department, but also as an administrative team that we have to address. So students that are sitting in a class and they're supposed to be getting um, a real life, real life experience. So if we're sitting in a business class and in this business class, one of the things you're supposed to be doing is running accounting software. Or if you're sitting in a tech ed class and you know you can't run the programs that you need to run and we're running them on a Chromebook instead, are we giving the students the right experience? Are they getting the full experience? And my answer would be no. So if I'm running, um, you know, I'm trying to run, I don't know, CAD on a Chromebook, it's not the same experience at all. And you're never going to see an engineer running CAD on a Chromebook, ever. Um, so th that's part of it. So I will say that's one issue we have to look at is just in general, are we giving the kids the things that we're saying that we should be providing to them? Um, I will say that I've seen students at the elementary level doing things that I think people never thought that they would be able to do. So when we talk about project-based learning and we talk about what students should be able to demonstrate, I'm seeing it. So I haven't had a great opportunity to get out there just because of everything that's been going on, but I, I I have been impressed time and time again by what I see students doing. I think it's going to keep growing um, as we move forward. So I think our our coaches that we have in the district, um, we have about two and a half right now, they're working very strongly with our Department of Teaching and Learning to make sure that all of our district um, programs are aligned and so that we're showing um, our teachers what to do with our students and then also having our students teach other students. So that was one of the most amazing things that I saw. And at Lincoln, it was just really phenomenal to see these students getting up and showing like they were making, um, they were doing a research project and they were showing each other how to further enhance their project. So um, that's something 
that I think is really important when we look at education are students getting those experiences. Um, I'll say for 21st century learning, it's always changing. So uh, one of our department members and I were talking about that today is what is 21st century learning? What does that mean? So when I was in elementary school, I was coding in kindergarten. And then coding kind of just fell off the map. You know, so when we talk about those types of things, I think coding is a really important skill. It's great for problem solving. It's great for st strategic thinking. It's something that's built into the iPad. There's curriculum already on the iPad. Um, kids can do it at any time. So that's the thing when, when students are in their wind time or they have no wind time, um, the teacher really doesn't have to do very much because it's just self-led. So I think those are important things for our students to have because you could tie that right back into math and you could also tie it into ELA because most of coding is really syntax and it's language. So if you can under have students understand that coding relates directly back to language, you know, then they can construct a sentence much more fluently um, than maybe they could before. So I think we're constantly assessing what 21st century learning looks like to give you a blanket answer and say, this is what it looks like right now. It's a snapshot. Like this is where we are right now. I don't think that any of us in the district is satisfied in saying this is just enough. We want our students to be you know, brighter, better, have more experiences. Um, I'll say that our technology budget um, is, is fairly low. So when you look at our overall operating budget, um, with this increase, we'll be at a little over 1% of the total operating budget. So it may seem like it's a hefty price tag, um, but when you look at the investment that it's putting back for students and giving them those experiences, it's really not that hefty of a price tag in my eyes. Um, and then there was the, the second part of that was um, some of these items that I think you had kind of mentioned that that was there were some requirements that we have these for insurance oh, purposes. Yep. Yeah. So, so some of them are, I mean, they're not just only insurance requirements. Some of them are also best practices. So I think many of you, if you work in the private sector, um, you've used MFA, you know, you know about endpoint uh, detection and response. We work in a large organization. We're doing this not only because of the insurance companies, but because we feel like it's really the best thing to do. We want to make sure that our um, everyone within our school community is protected. So that's part of that uh, purchase point as well, is just making sure that we have a more safe and secure environment. And thank you for sharing that perspective of the, of the technology budget within the scope of the broader general operating budget, because I think it's important to recognize that, while well, yes, our kids have more today in terms of technology access um, than they maybe ever have in the history of this district, it's important that we recognize, and I appreciate you sharing your vision as well, that um, it, it's not about things. And it's and yes, they don't have clear touch panels, interactive uh, pan boards, and, and, and there's, there are m many massive price tickets out there that we could be giving our kids that we're not. Because it's, but for here, for us, at least for, for me anyway, it's, it's not about the things that they have in front of them, it's what they do with them. So we're doing a lot of, um, from what you're sharing with us, a lot of amazing stuff. Our kids are doing a lot of amazing stuff. Um, and we could uh, throw some pretty hefty price tags in front of the kids. And if they just kind of sit there in the classroom, not nothing's happening with them, um, that would be um, a real shame. So the fact that we're able to do so much with, um, quite a lot um, is, is uh, a real testament to um, kind of the, the vision of, of your team and, and um, at the classroom level as well, the willingness to buy into it. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Okay, Mr. Champagne. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on something that Mr. Smith, I mean, one of the things that I've always thought is one of the great programs here is Project Lead the Way, which is, you know, a very, STEM oriented set of you know classes and so forth and so you know the price tag for that looks high but what it actually does for those kids and the amount of the number of kids that have taken advantage of it it's really a great return on investment so you know I concur with Ms. with Ms. what Mr. Smith is saying you know that the, the the amount of money you know just looking at picking off individual items may seem like it's you know a big price tag but in total Plus, also what it's giving back to the kids, and especially in that program, uh, is one that you know I think is invaluable for what we're doing. So, 
Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Uh, Dr. Whitney. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, so since I'm fairly new to the board, could you just um, tell me who's on the technology committee? What is that committee comprised of? Who is it comprised of? There are different members of the technology committee um, pretty much every year, and the reason why we do that is because we want to hear different student voices and different teachers. I don't want to hear the same consistent people that are the super user. So when we, when I was doing coaching previously, it, we would always target the middle. So that was my, my feel, was that I don't want to target the best and the brightest. I don't want to target the people that don't like technology. You want to see who's in the middle, who can we grow? And we do that with our students too. So when, when, we, when I ask for student volunteers from the principals and say, do you have any good names that I can, um, of students that I can talk with? I really ask them to give me the whole gamut of student body. You know, so I don't want to just see our top level students. I don't want to see, you know, students that aren't here all day. We want to see your average student. So um, it's been a lot of different students. I have a huge spreadsheet of students right now. Um, I've talked from to elementary teachers from every single building, secondary teachers from every building. I've talked with every secondary department chair back in this last spring, this fall, this winter. Some of them, I've had repeated conversations with them. Um, and it's just, again, to make sure that we're meeting their needs and their vision. So it really is, we try to make it as comprehensive as possible. So the membership refreshes annually, basically. You, you reevaluate the students on it. We do. And the reason why, again, is just we want to make sure that we're giving them um, the advice they need. So if we're finding there's any large deficits out there, we want to make sure that we can at least address it or give them the opportunity to trial something else. Um, so far, the kids are fairly happy with the Chromebooks. You know, there are some, you know, different needs that they look at with, um, you know, some of the projects that they're doing. But then we try to provide the buildings back with other things that they could use. Mm -hmm. Have have there ever been the case where a student suggested, say, a software a piece of software that was that came out of those discussions on that committee that was then implemented into the classroom? Not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't say that it won't happen. There are some of the students at the high school, especially, that um, bring up some really great points. Um, and even I think some of the, the elementary students, they, they'll come in and they found some wonderful app that's really useful to use in school. Um, we're not against hearing out those, um, those when they bring those subjects up, because sometimes they're the ones who find the best things. Yeah. So we'll investigate it from there. And just one more thing, and I don't know if this goes, I mean, this goes probably outside the scope of your office particularly, you're doing much more important things, but I, I don't know if it's ever been uh, happened that our graduates have been contacted or polled on any level, say, two years out, five years out, and what didn't they get, or what, you know, is there, is there any way that that could inform uh, what we do? Do we have the ability to do that, I guess, first of all, and I understand that's a, you know, asking for people's time and effort. Um, but I just want to put it out as as an idea because it seems to me like two years out into the world or even post-college we could get some really good information. I think it's something that we could look at as an administrative team and it's not just the device needs it's curricular needs too but I, I think um, I know that we're putting together some panels with students to get some of the information but um, it's definitely something I think that would be useful for us. Yeah, thanks. Any additional comments or questions? All right, well, I'd like to uh, th thank the board for their questions. I'd like to thank Dr. Dr. Manzo for her thorough responses, very informational. And to echo what Mr. Bird said, please extend our gratitude to uh, your department for all their hard work. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is personnel. Um, I have a motion. So moved. Second. Any comments or questions? If not, Ms. Allen, will you call the roll? Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bo Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Uh, before we move on, I believe Dr. Campbell has uh, some comments you'd like to make. Yeah, I just want to recognize um, 
on the the board just accepted the resignation of Dr. Kate Kiras, who, as most know, is the current principal of Emmaus High School. Um, and she unfortunately announced that this will be her final year as principal of Emmaus High School. Um, most people know that Dr. Kiras has been a valued member of our East Penn team actually for a decade now. Um, she first served as assistant principal at Emmaus High School from 2006 to 2011. Um, she left for a period of time. She was in the Palisades School District and has experience as a director of curriculum as well as assistant superintendent. Um, and then she came, Kate returned to Emmaus High School in 2017 as principal. And as I, I've said before, um, I believe at a public board meeting, leadership is challenging during calm times. Um, and so you throw in there a flood and a pandemic, um, and it can be an extraordinarily daunting task. And for those of you who know Dr. Kiras, um, I know that you would agree that she consistently has demonstrated remarkable optimism and strength as a leader through the challenges that she's faced. Um, we're sad to see her leave the high school um, and incredibly grateful for the generous amount of time that she has awarded our team so that um, we can certainly identify the very best next leader of Emmaus High School. And I have no doubt that Dr. Kiras will continue to positively contribute to education as she looks ahead to new opportunities. And um, again, we'll certainly, we have, um, we have the gift of continuing to work with her throughout the spring, um, but I just wanted to take this, this opportunity to publicly recognize and thank her um, for her work. Um, Ms. Bowman? Um, I just wanted to echo that. I, I was really sad to see Dr. Kieres' uh, resignation, although I'm um, happy for her with, um, with her future life plans. Um, you know, in a short period of time, she really started to steer the ship of the high school in a positive direction, started to make um, some really phenomenal changes to the school culture, was always available to anybody who had a suggestion for improvement was available especially to the students um, case in point uh, we all get the school newspaper here at the board and I, I think you should read the um, editorial about press freedom and she's quoted in that she makes herself available um, when the students need her and you know you can become really used to that as a parent or as a board member as a student and think that that's the status quo and it's really not she she took a culture and changed it and took it in a positive direction so i really hope that um you know the next person can fill her shoes and continue to make those improvements i know anybody listening to me might be sitting there thinking oh we're not done yet that's <laughs> that school has a ways to go and it probably does but um I think we would be remiss to not um, give uh, Dr. Kiers the credit she deserves for all of the um, positive changes that she made in a short period of time and during a challenging short period of time. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Any additional comments? Well, I too uh, was, was disappointed to, to see Dr. Kiers tender her resignation. Uh, Again, truly grateful for her service in this district and what she's done for the high school, so I can certainly appreciate what Ms. Bowman and Dr. Campbell said about her. Um, I will say that I am grateful that we do have her for another few months, um, and uh, we'll just uh, um, relish that time as long as we can. Okay, with that, uh, let's move on to uh, business operations. Uh, if there are no objections, I'd like to take items A, B, C, and D together. So a motion? Second. Uh, any comments or questions? Uh, if not, Ms. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item is, is curriculum. I'm going to take these items separately. Uh, first item is the, for the motion to approve the 22-23 East Penn School District student teacher calendar. We have a motion. So moved. Second. Are there any comments or questions? 
If not, Ms. Allen, you call the roll. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, now get a motion for uh, item B under curriculum. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Uh, Ms. Allen, you call the roll. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item is uh, policy, uh, second reading uh, for a uh, new draft of policy 011. Are there uh, anything we can, any comments or questions? Dr. Povolitis, would you like to review any any changes? I think I'll save them the walk. Okay. Um, I'll, ju I'll just say, because um, this is a simple one, the one piece that we did um, revise is that we've incorporated the board feedback regarding um, the reference to maintaining confidentiality and specifically put that particular piece under the act ethically, which is on page two. So that was really the only revision that we've made based on feedback from our last discussion. Okay, thank you. Any further comment or questions? Right, if not, this will move to third reading at our, at our next meeting. Uh, next item is other educational energy entities. Uh, Mr. Champagne, do you have an update from CTI? Yes, thank you, Dr. Levinson. Uh, the LCTI Joint Operating Committee held a hybrid meeting on uh, February 23rd. Uh, during that meeting, we reviewed and approved changes to the health and safety plan, which provided the executive director uh, with the latitude to make uh, mask requirements optional starting March 1st, and I believe he did re uh, re uh, rescind the mask mandate and it is an optional policy. Uh, Holly Keller, uh, it will take uh, the position of new business manager starting 4-4-22. The online application process, something that they've been working on uh, for uh, quite some time now, has started to root uh, as of uh, Mar uh, February 23rd, we had 560 applicants to date. It's a much str more streamlined process for the applicant. It links directly to the district, uh, sending district. Uh, there is still the option to do a paper application for those that prefer that. Uh, but they're really, you know, uh, seeing, uh, I think, a good response on the online application uh, process. Uh, fifth grade tours, uh, as of the end of March, 1,400, stu 1400 students will be going through uh, to see LCTI. And I believe I have this number correct, 355 students from East Penn. And that was as, as of the time we had the meeting. There may be more that are signed up. I think West Coastville and one other school were not in the list. I Hopefully they got... Uh, part of the list. Uh, the animal science program, which I talked about previously, has already got 31 applicants, so we already are over uh, uh, subscribed. There's a total of 25 places, so that program looks like it's getting off to a, a very good start. Uh, as of 223, four districts had approved the 22 23 budgets Catasauqua, Northern Lehigh, Northwest Lehigh, and Salisbury, in addition to ourselves. I assume by the time we meet next week, all, all of the districts will have voted on the budget, and hopefully that will be approved. And finally, uh, they have a new tagline for LCTI is Opportunity Ahead, uh, which they've also been working on for a while. And then the Senior Recognition Night, which is a big uh, celebration, hopefully will be in person on May 31st at the PPL Center. That is my report. Hey, thank you, Mr. Champagne. Are there any comments or questions? Okay, uh, there are no other items. Uh, in a matter of announcements, there was an executive session this evening where we addressed safety and security, negotiations, personnel, and confidentiality. Our next regular board meeting will be in two weeks on Monday, March 28th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, if nothing else, uh, I'd like to get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, so say aye. 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 Abstain, no. Meeting adjourned, thank you very much.